reposted a message um, diagramming tripartite man, and I have another one to follow up. That was from July. Uh, people got a lot out of that because it helped them understand why, even though they know they're born of God, even though they know that they're justified by faith, they still have issues with their heart and with their flesh, okay? And see, the confusion comes when people cling to this idea, well, I, it, you know, if I'm really made the righteousness of God in Christ, then that means I've got to have a certain kind of living to evidence it, or maybe I'm not really saved. I mean, it really comes down to that. It is a gospel issue. And the Calvinists and the Catholics and most Christians subconsciously hold on to this idea, or consciously, some more than others, that righteousness is not just imputed to us, it's not just credited to us, we are righteous in our life because our heart has gotten a transplant. Our, we have a new heart. Uh, as if God replaced our old heart with a new heart. Now the heart is the mind, will, and emotions plus the conscience. Um, and what the, the whole thing about the new covenant, the reason people are responding so strongly and want to fight for the new heart is works righteousness. Because... They're backloading works into the evidence of how you know someone's a Christian or how you know you're a Christian. Because they believe the new creation happens primarily in the heart. They don't distinguish between the spirit and the heart. That's so important. When we were reckoned as righteous and we believed the gospel, our spirit was made alive together with Christ. That is the part that was regenerated. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And then our spirit, by walking according to the spirit, has the ability to impact our heart in varying degrees, depending on where we set our affections and our mind. See, we still have to set our affections and our mind on Christ. There's all these admonitions, not to set our affections elsewhere but on Christ because that is the source of the spirit in our life. Where is Christ? He's in our spirit. Now people are saying because I say we don't have a new heart as in uh, the new covenant provisions for the new heart for Israel. If you look at them, it is that they will each know God. No one will have to teach them to know God. They won't have teachers. They won't have prophets. He will cleanse and wash them from all filthiness and idolatry and even transgressions. They won't even commit transgression anymore, according to Ezekiel. Uh, and they will know God and walk in his ways by his keeping power as a display of uh, a display of Christ, really. Um to be a holy nation in front of all the nations to sanctify his name. That's not what we have. We can still sin. Okay. And there's a whole group of people out there based on their stand that we have the new covenant and a new heart say that I'm not saved because believing the gospel can't be looked at as a reliable evidence that you're saved in their view. You have to have something they can see certain kind of quality, certain kind of lovingness, certain kind of personality, okay? And so they can discard someone's profession of faith in the gospel and say he's still not saved. And now they're getting a little more sophisticated with it. They're pulling out uh, resources from uh, thoroughly what I call Galatianized resources, and Protestantism that are really just Roman Catholic views because this has been this is something that has de been debated again and again and again throughout this is it's like there needs to be a reformation every day because the prevailing concept of the natural man is that if you were really born again you would be better than you are and I know I'm born again because I'm better than you and that's really what it comes down to I'm holier than you I'm more righteous than you. I'm more loving than you. 
Therefore, I know I'm saved and you're not. Totally discarding the fact that uh, he who works not but he that, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted, imputed, I'm sorry, uh, imputed to him as righteousness, reckoned to him as righteousness, accounted to him as righteousness. And that is a righteousness that we believe without seeing sometimes. Yes, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, but my righteousness is in heaven. It's Christ himself. I don't have a righteousness apart from Christ. And to the degree, and he has now come into my spirit. First, as the gospel, as the spirit that bears witness to God's testimony concerning his son in me. And then, as I learn to walk according to the spirit, by setting my mind on the things of the spirit, my mind can be life and peace, and he can fill my soul. My soul can be filled with the realization of Christ, so that I rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, based on realizations of who he is and what he's accomplished for me. But that comes from confidence in the gospel, that no matter what kind of behavior I've exhibited, what kind of person I am in my flesh, I've been accepted in the beloved, and I'm reckoned as righteous because Christ is my righteousness. It's all based on Christ. It's not something God infuses into me apart from Christ. It is Christ. So for the Christian, his righteousness, if you want to talk about righteous living, it is entirely a matter of Christ making his home in your heart. And that's why Paul prayed that you'd be strengthened into your inner man by his spirit, uh, according to the riches of his glory, that Christ, that you being rooted and grounded in love, uh, that Christ would make his home in your heart through faith. It's by faith. Faith is walking not by what I see, but by the unseen. I look not to those things which are seen, but to the things which are unseen. Based on God's declaration in his word, I believe God is the one who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead. And I know he's made my spirit life because I believe the gospel. And I've been justified unto life and Christ dwells in my spirit. I believe that. And I believe he's accessible to me and I believe I can fellowship with him and I believe I have him. And to the degree that I enjoy that kind of truth by faith, which is really just what I've inherited in Christ, he makes his home in my heart. He can make his home in my heart so that what is true in my spirit can affect my heart. But that does not mean I'm going to have a sinless living, sinless perfection. Now, most of the people who are arguing for the new heart will at least, hopefully, agree that we are not here for sinless perfection. But they're saying that this is a deny, for saying we don't have a new heart like in uh, th what God is talking about when he talks about the new covenant. That has not been fulfilled for us uh, related to the heart. It is him continually turning their heart and keeping them in his way. Um so that they do not backslide, they don't even sin. Now they're saying I, that we who believe in imputed righteousness uh, are denying the sufficiency of the work of Christ. And that's just, you know, I mean, what are you going to do at that point? This is, a, this is a gospel issue. The sufficiency of the work of Christ was that when he shed his blood, he said, it is finished. Then he was risen. And everybody who calls on him and believes in him, not makes him the Lord of their life, but believes on him, is reckoned as righteous and then sealed with the Holy Spirit and then regenerated in their spirit. But that does not guarantee that their life is not going to have all kinds of problems. The gospel's for sinners for a reason. Um, and so they want to say that I'm not saved and they want to jump on this bandwagon and say I'm a heretic because I say what the scripture says, not what their traditions say regarding the new covenant. It's specifically said to be for the house of Israel. 
You know, it's like, why did they lose their stuff over that? Well, it's because they're hanging on to this idea of the new heart because they believe that's their righteousness. Their righteousness to them is imparted and infused, not imputed. No, we are credited as righteous, but righteousness in our life is manifested to the degree that we know how to walk according to the spirit. And most people don't even know they have a regenerated spirit. So what they have, instead of the righteousness of Christ, or Christ as righteousness magnified in their body, is a sanctimonious religiosity in the flesh that they're maintaining in the flesh. And while they're maintaining that sanctimonious religiosity that they think is their holiness and righteousness, they're actually sowing to the flesh. Which is why they get so offended and can go from wall to wall and release attack videos and talk about a person and absolutely defame his character, absolutely mischaracterize what he teaches, and publicly, uh, you know, publicly denounce him, <laughs> even though he's a believer in Christ, over a secondary issue. Their character is showing. Now, does that mean they're not saved? Some of them aren't. Some of them are, but they're sowing to their religious flesh, and they think it's their godliness. And so the more they go, the more offended they will be, and there will be a bigger and bigger crowd of them. Um, because this is ultimately a rejection of sound doctrine. They want to call it semantics and fancy, eloquent speech, but really all I do is show you in the scriptures where I get what I believe. That's all I'm doing. And yeah, God gives me utterance so that I can speak it as I ought. I speak strongly, but I speak the scriptures. They admittedly do not listen to me. They listen to slanderous mischaracterizations of what I teach. And the ones that have tried to come and argue with me about these things um, have not listened to my responses. And then if I don't agree with them and I show them scriptures to the contrary of what they're saying, they just call me prideful. And then they start the character assassination. And it is a gospel issue once you get to the point where you're saying that if someone doesn't have the fruit that I think I should see, uh, that means they don't have a new heart, which means that the work of Christ is not being carried on in them and it's because they don't believe the gospel. And in fact, the gospel is not just, uh, not that Christ imputed righteousness to me or credited it to my account. Well, now you're back to Catholicism. You've just undone the Protestant Reformation. And unfortunately, this is why the Protestant churches are headed back towards Rome, because they've all renounced the Reformation uh, in terms of of justification by faith alone apart from works. They don't have a problem with the Roman Catholic, Augustinian, Calvinistic version of righteousness, which is, oh no, if you're really righteous, then you've got to have the fruit, and if you don't, then that means you're not righteous, and you're not justified by faith alone. It's faith plus work. So it is faith plus works. That's the root. All the other stuff is camouflage and a smoke screen to hide the fact that this really is a, it is a gospel issue. Who do you believe is justified and how do you know they're justified? Is it because they have a new heart? Now we can argue about that, but if you say that uh, you're justified because you have a new heart, not because you believe the gospel, then your ground of justification, you've moved to ground of justification from Christ to yourself. Our justification is based on what we believe Christ did while we were yet sinners. While we were weak, while we were ungodly, Christ died for us. It's what he did on the cross that uh, I believe unto salvation. His death and resurrection, not his impartation of himself into me and the effects it produces. That's getting the cart before the horse. 
Yes, it produces effects in my life once I believe the gospel. Okay, now there is room for discussion about what those effects should be and how strong they should be and where they should be looked for. But the gospel is that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. The reason we call that alien righteousness is because it has nothing to do with me. My righteousness is a person who's in heaven. And it's manifested in heaven. My righteousness is manifested in heaven. Romans 3 talks about how Christ himself was manifested as a propitiation for our sins to declare God's righteousness. Where? In the heavens. On the, on the mercy seat, his blood testifies about my righteousness. Even though my body is dead because of sin. Even though I'm ungodly. And even when I believe the gospel, I'm justified when I believe that, even though I'm ungodly. But then, yes, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And where does he come to dwell? In my spirit. And yes, it affects my heart. But then throughout the New Testament, we are taught what to do with our heart and mind, which is really the same thing. What to do with our heart by setting our affections and our mind on the things of the Spirit. That's a learning process, which requires a ministry. And that is different from the New Covenant under Israel. They won't have a ministry like that. Because they'll each know God fully. It's a, it's a, it is a special outpouring for them. Okay, Does it make them better than us? No. We have inherited the heavens at that point. We're seated at the right hand of God. We have the highest position in the universe. So this is not putting Israel above the church. This is talking about when the kingdom comes. What will it look like? You know? And there's people who want to say that those things that belong to Israel, that God said are for Israel, or are for the church, and then they're measuring whether or not you're saved by whether or not you manifest them to a degree that they're satisfied. And no, I don't expect them to agree with me at this point or listen because their hearts are actually closed to the gospel, not to me. They have moved the ground of justification from themselves or from Christ to themselves. That's denying the sufficiency of the work of Christ. But they're saying that I'm denying the sufficiency of the work of Christ because I don't say we have a new heart. When the scripture clearly tells us that that is for Israel, number one, and number two, that our heart is not going to be kept the way the new covenant says the heart is kept. That we have to set our affections on things above. We have to set our mind on things above. We can still walk according to the flesh. We can have a mind of the flesh. We can have an evil heart of unbelief. We can have a heart that hardens itself. And doesn't listen to God, according to Hebrews. Um, we can have, uh, we can walk according to the Gentiles in the futility of our mind, according to Paul. If we couldn't, then there wouldn't be admonitions all through the Scripture about idols, all through the New Testament epistles written to New Testament believers. Um, we have all kinds of admonitions about sin. That proceeds from the heart. Why would we need that? If what is true based on the new covenant is actually fulfilled in our day. So, you know, the thing is, is there there's this huge crowd of people that are all offended about this. And what they're offended about primarily is that you're attacking what they think is their righteousness. I've always said, we all agree that sin is bad, but when you tell someone their righteousness is condemned, that's when the fangs come out, if they're legalistic, if they're rejecting the gospel at some level. They want to believe that they are righteous. They want to believe that they are full of love. They want to believe that they are godly. They want to believe that they are holy and you are not. Um, not based on their faith in the gospel, but because they supposedly have a new heart. And yet they evidence what's in their heart by what they say. What they say about a brother and how they reject the truth of the word. 
So, you know, it really comes down to look at the character. Now, I'm not saying sin, sin, you know, if somebody sins, look at that. I'm saying, what are they full? Their mind is full of offense. Their hearts are full of offense and anger and rage. The wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Where is all this anger coming from if they have this new heart? How can they say the things they're saying about me if they've got this new heart? They're saying I have a demon. They're saying God showed them in a dream that I had black eyes and my eyes were closed and I missed the rapture and I'm a false teacher and a false, not a believer, you know. Well, the way you know if I'm a believer is to look at my gospel. And they reject that. More and more, they reject that. They say, no, that's not how you know a believer. Not by the gospel they believe, but the kind of life they live. Well, okay. You do not believe what the gospel says. You're not Protestant. You are going back to Rome with the rest of them. There's nothing more to say. And yes, they're going to outnumber us 100 to 1. But they're calling themselves the grace community. That's the sad thing. You know, the Calvinists, the way they worked their doctrines into Christianity was by calling them the doctrines of grace. They hijack the language of grace and then infuse it with works and call themselves the grace community here on YouTube. They're not. They're not grace. They are law. They are works. They are evidence. They're fruit inspectors and works backloaders. So, if you're not clear on the gospel, then you will probably go that way. Uh, my channel is to help assure and shore up confidence in the gospel, not confidence in yourself. And the gospel is the work that Christ accomplished apart from you, not the work he accomplishes later in you. About five months ago, most of this group stopped really contending for the gospel and started rebuking those who do. Uh, Greg Jackson became a big target because he kept contending for the gospel and they didn't want to hear it anymore. And they started calling it divisive. Um, they used to contend supposedly for grace, but what they were contending for was a version of grace that said, you know, the, the point of the argument was, no, you can't lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation, okay? And they were arguing that with people who said you could lose your salvation. And that's fine. That's good. Um, we should be secure in our uh, assurance of salvation. But they didn't articulate what the assurance of salvation should be based on in those arguments. Um, in a clear enough way, for us to really see where they were coming from. But about five months ago, they started uh, wanting to make this distinction really boldly about the heart and the mind and say, and it was, a, it was actually about me, but they said, he's not saved because he doesn't believe with his heart. He only believes with his mind. <laughs> and they were distinguishing heart and mind. And we had a whole go around in the grace community about that. That, no, the heart and the mind are the same thing. They're two different parts of the sa same thing. The, the heart, the understanding is, uh, the, the heart is the seat of the understanding. We understand with our heart, we understand with our mind. And we knew they weren't listening back then. Um, but at that point, they were saying you could have the profession of faith accurate, the gospel accurate, and yet not be a believer. Uh, a genuine believer because they said you have to have a sense of whether or not someone's a believer based on something subjective, based on certain fruit, based on certain personality, based on certain feeling they had. And they didn't have that about me. Okay. They had dreams supposedly that I'm basically like a Nephilim, you know, <laughs> and it went on and on. And eventually I just shut, I just uh, turned from that whole community. Um, and since then, they stopped contending for the gospel. They stopped even pretending to contend for it. It's all been dreams and visions, okay, that didn't come to pass. All these, some of them are outright date setting, but all of them thought we were going to be out of here.
because of the rapture. And we're not yet. We're still here. And that's a source of stumbling and offense for many. And remember Jesus said, you know, uh, there will be servants that say, my master delays his coming and will be, get, become drunk and turn and beat the fellow servants. That's where we are right now. This is the time of offense where the love is growing cold, ironically. Um, now, these are people who insist that they love God with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength and yet can't recognize a brother by the testimony. Now, how do we know someone's a believer? You have to settle that. And I've talked about this for a year. What is it that indicates whether somebody's a believer or not? It's whether they believe the gospel. They have the testimony. They believe God's record concerning his son. The spirit bears witness to God's record concerning his son that it is true. And he who believes the record has the record in himself because he's born of God. And what is that record? That Christ came through blood and water, or Christ is the propitiation for our sins. Not our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Christ died for my sins, according to the scriptures, and rose for my justification. That's what I believe, and believing that, apart from any works on my part, evidences that I am saved. And if I'm saved, I'm sealed with the Spirit. You can't fruit inspect and tell me that I'm not saved and I don't uh, have the Spirit based on your assessment apart from the Gospel. And John wrote 1 John so that the believers could have assurance that they have eternal life by knowing that it's based on what they believe. And we talked about the way of Cain. The way of Cain is to refuse to recognize a believer by the Gospel. Okay, So that's what this group was doing. And now others, more, more are getting sucked into it. Now there's this guy that has gotten offended about my teaching, not from that standpoint, but because he has a problem with the future role of Israel. And he thinks that because I'm genetically Jewish, I have a Zionist agenda. <laughs> so, and, but they're latching on to him because he's loud and they love it. So they're all over on his wall again, rehearsing old stuff. I haven't talked to these people in five months. I turned from them five months ago. Um, but that's what's going on. And, and I need to say this because in case you're confused, this is just a gospel issue that's been going on for a while. Not everybody who says their grace is grace. Calvinists say their grace. Catholics say their grace. But what is the, what is the way I know a believer? How do I know if I'm a believer? How do I know I have eternal life? If you turn it to, well, I look at myself for my assurance, then you have lost your sight of the crucified Christ, and you will fall under condemnation. But John says, beloved, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And he appeals not to our heart for assurance, but to our faith that Jesus Christ is our advocate and he himself is uh, Jesus Christ the righteous, the propitiation for our sins. His blood is how I am reconciled to God, not me correcting my life or believing I have a new heart. We don't, it's not that we believe something about ourselves to get saved. We believe something about Christ. And there's another you know, proof text. How can your heart condemn you if it's a new heart? And they say the conscience is perfected. Well, then why would we need to be perfected in the love of God? You know, uh, the whole thing about John is talking about perf being perfected in the love of God and letting the uh, perfect love cast out fear so that your heart is assured before him. Why do we need to assure our heart? Because our conscience condemns us, which is part of our heart. Beloved, if your heart condemns you. So no, our conscience needs to be sprinkled. Our conscience needs to be renewed. Our conscience needs to be purged. It's not perfected. Otherwise, you wouldn't experience condemnation in your life. Uh, but the point is that this is a gospel issue at the core. Not the part about whether or not we partake of any blessings of the new covenant. There's plenty of people that know that that covenant is ultimately fulfilled for Israel, but believe that we partake of some of its blessings. That's fine. If you want to say the law of the spirit of life is the same thing uh, as the law written on the heart and the mind, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's secondary until you use 
new covenant provisions to judge whether or not someone's a believer, and that's what they do. That's why it's worth contending for and clarifying. I'm not interested in some sidebar about Israel and their destiny. My point is, how do we recognize a believer? How do I know I'm a believer? And how do I get the expectations right about the Christian life? What do I look to for my spirituality? I don't look to Israel's new covenant. I look to Paul's ministry and Peter's ministry and John's ministry, which is for the body of Christ based on the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory that was hidden. That's a totally different kind of spirituality that has to do with being crucified with Christ and emerging from his resurrection, not being a separate party with which he's made a covenant, but being baptized into Christ himself, who is the heir of all the covenants and the mediator. We have a higher position. We are in Christ. Um, so this one guy who is loudly mischaracterizing all my teachings and calling the radio shows and all that has gathered to himself this previous group of people that no longer contends for the gospel. They don't sound any different from the people they used to be arguing with. And that's on them. That's not on me. That's on them. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you look at my community wall, you're not going to see the ad hominem attacks on people and people speculating about people's salvation. You're going to see edifying fellowship about the gospel of Christ. But you go to these walls, look at what they're saying. And you just ask yourself, is that the fruit of the gospel? Is that the fruit of the spirit? No. So there's not much more to say about it, but I did feel like I needed to clarify what's going on um, for the sake of my subs who may be confused. Again, we are saved by believing the gospel, not whether or not we have a part in a covenant. That's more advanced learning. Okay. You say, well, why did you bring it up? I didn't. <laughs> Others brought it up and I have to defend it. I have to defend what I believe, and I've been thorough about it from the scriptures. And it's helped some people, and others have gotten confused. Uh, you know, you, ha you have to be a Berean. What is a Berean? A Berean is someone who honestly listens to what the person is saying and then searches the scriptures to see if the things are so. Not refuses to listen to the person, but instead listens to a feeling combined with mischaracterizations and slander. And then says, I'm a Berean because I'm not going to listen to that guy. <laughs> because this is what I already believe about the scriptures and I'm unwilling to be taught. I'm unwilling to have a dialogue. Well, I, you know, that is what it is. All right, take care.